ground rules for the webinar. Um, all of the panelists, as I'm sure you suspect, are remote, and that makes the logistics of this a little bit uh, more difficult, so we ask you to, to bear with that fact. Now, we will be recording the webinar, and a link to the webinar will be sent to you later this week. We do have a good deal of ground that we want to cover today. I suspect that the webinar may extend beyond the hour. We're going to try our best to answer any questions that you have from the audience. Uh, there is a mechanism in the program for you to type questions to us. We do, however, have over 200 participants signed up for the webinar, and we do have limited time, so it may not be feasible for us to answer every question. If we don't answer a question live, we will have one of the panelists try and reach out to you to answer the question later in the week. For introductions, for those of you who don't know me, I am chair of Becker's staffing practice group. Becker is a boutique law firm that focuses its practice in certain discrete industries. Our largest industry practice group is our staffing industry practice group. We offer advice to staffing firms on their operational and strategic legal needs. On the operational end, we offer advice on law, employment law compliance, best practices for onboarding and offboarding, and client contract review. And on the strategic end, we offer advice on matters such as corporate structure, corporate governance, finance, key employee compensation, and mergers and acquisitions. Becker has represented over 100 staffing brands in the last few years. I personally focus my practice on rep presenting uh, staffing firm owners and C-suite officers on matters such as corporate governance, key employee compensation, and mergers and acquisitions. My team and I have provided advice on over 30 merger and acquisition deals in the past few years. And we're lucky to have two very, very distinguished leaders in the staffing industry who will be serving as our panelists. I've had the pleasure of working with both of these gentlemen over the years. Our first panelist is Michael Epstein. Michael is the former CEO and president of Cowork Staffing Services. Coworks is one of the largest staffing firms in the U.S. I believe it was recently ranked by SAA as the 52nd largest staffing firm. Michael assumed control as CEO and president of Coworks in 2005, and under his leadership, Coworks grew exponentially. When he stepped down as CEO and president, Coworks has over 300 million in revenue, 90 offices nationwide, and approximately 50,000 field employees. Michael has the honor of having been named to SIA's top 100 most influential leaders in the staffing industry five times. And most importantly, Michael led Coworks through the Great Recession. Under his leadership, Coworks not only managed to survive the Great Recession, but he had Coworks positioned in such a fantastic place at the end of the recession that it was able to grow exponentially post the Great Recession. Our second panelist is Patrick Morin. Patrick is the managing director at Transact Capital, an investment banking firm with offices throughout the United States. Transact Capital represents staffing firms in capital raises, mergers and acquisitions, and other strategic advice. Patrick works side by side with CEOs on a number of strategic initiatives. Those initiatives include mergers and acquisitions, marketing and revenue generation, crisis management to st stabilize operations and cash flow, and employee performance metrics. Importantly for Patrick, Patrick was the CEO of Electronica Medical Records Company during the Great Recession and successfully led Electronica through a capital raise, integration of an acquisition, while at the same time managing the impact of the recession on Electronica's core business. Good afternoon, Patrick and Michael. Hello, Good Marty. Afternoon. Good afternoon, both of you. I'd like to set the stage for our discussion by, by paraphrase, paraphrasing an article I read in the Harvard Business Review earlier this week. Harvard just dedicated a whole issue to crisis management in, uh, of COVID-19. 
And um, I think this, this paraphrase may set the stage for our discussion. And basically what the author said at the beginning of this article was the coronavirus crisis, like every crisis, is unfolding over an arc of time. It will have a beginning, it'll have a middle, and it will have an end. And it's useful to think of it this way as you try and lead your enterprises through um, kind of this situation. Um, right now, um, we're in a period of chaos and disruption, but eventually that will change and we'll be in a middle state, and then we'll come to the end of this crisis. So I think that's kind of what the purpose of this webinar is, to talk about kind of the immediate impact and the long-term impact of this and how folks can deal with that. Um, I think the natural st st starting point is to discuss leadership in a crisis. Uh, Patrick and Michael, each of you um, led your respective companies through the Great Recession. I think the audience will benefit greatly from hearing your thoughts on leadership in a crisis. And I'll start with you, Patrick. And here's my question. Is building confidence of your employees the first priority of a leader in a crisis? And what, if so, what steps and tactics should you employ to build confidence in your employees? Thanks, Marty. I appreciate that, and uh, I'm, I'm honored, happy to be on this uh, to be on this seminar, and really looking forward to this interaction. But when it comes to, I think the Harvard Business article certainly get it, got it right, which is every crisis is going to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Although my kids would argue that they are at the end of their Netflix subscriptions; they've seen everything on there. Um, but in this case, uh, it's it's it's. It's true. We we seen we've seen this arc of the beginning of this crisis, the middle, and eventually it's going to come. Uh, it'll eventually come to an end, and so it's going to be critical to us as leaders to be able to figure out exactly how we lead through this. And your question about building confidence uh, really is is insightful, because the single most important thing that we can do as leaders within our company is to build confidence within our team members because that is what ultimately extends out into our customer base into our vendor base and into the world in general is that when they feel comfortable and confident and comfortable is probably too strong a word but when they feel confident that they know where the organization is going and at least how it's going to be reacting to a changed marketplace uh, and they know what their roles are in it and they know how they contribute to the survivability of the organization, then those are the organizations that we see really step forward and grow out of crises like this rather than fold and cave. And to, you know, to that point, confidence comes from one of two places. It comes from even having a plan or it comes, Marty, from having results. Uh, if you've never done something before and you have no idea how to do it, your results are equal to zero. You've never done it. So the most important thing is, is to have a very clear plan as to what is going to happen and in terms of what your responses are going to be. If you've done something a thousand times, because you've done it a thousand times, your chances are you're going to be very confident that you're going to be able to do it a thousand and one time. So right now, this is something that we have never seen before in our culture and in our, in our economy. And so therefore, our R collectively as staffing companies and participations in this industry is zero. So therefore, planning is going to be building confidence in everyone from the CEO straight down to the frontline employee. Patrick. Michael, I want to follow up on that question with a question for you. Um, talk to me a little bit about what CoWORKs and, and what under your leadership CoWORKs did during the Great Recession in terms of trying to build confidence in its employees and also in terms of trying to build confidence in its clients. Thank you, uh, Marty. Uh, I'm going down both uh, fronts, uh, first with the internal employees and also I want to add your temporary employees. Uh, you have to be forthright. I mean, you talk about credibility and, uh, and getting trust, it comes about being forthright. And I think in today's world, uh, many employees will be nervous about their jobs. And the first question asked of leadership is, where are we with that? And 
I think sometimes you uh, natural reaction is to sort of like schluff it off, uh, but that create I think more anxiety. If you don't have the answer, say we're studying all options available, we're understanding the new legislation that's been passed uh, to see what options we have, and we're going to be meeting on a regular basis. And I think communication is key on a regular basis, meeting with leadership and all the way through chain of command, whether you have webinars like this uh, for your entire company. So I think for employees, it's being authentic, you know, answering the question, you know, uh, right on and not deferring it or giving a, a non-truthful answer and constant communication by all levels of the organization. On clients, I think we all know clients are very precious and uh, we all would say that we are very close to our clients. And I would say this is an opportunity to get even closer. As we are struggling, uh, they are struggling. You will have many clients or different niches within the industry. Uh, they are impacted in different ways locally through their own supply chains. And the closer you get to them, knowing exactly what they're facing, it's going to be part of your plan and how to come out of the recession ahead of the others, because you'll know what your client base is, their situation is, and how they will be coming out. So you will be able to track your, your turnaround timeline of investments, what you need to do with theirs. Thanks, Michael. I, I want to follow up with that answer with you, Michael. In terms of the number of times and how often you were communicating with your internal employees and your contingent workers, did you increase that during, during the crisis of the Great Recession? Did you keep it about the same? And, and what recommendations would you have now for, for folks, especially understanding that, that most of the communication is being done remotely instead of in person today? Yes. Well, I would say during Hurricane uh, Sandy, uh, when the East Coast was knocked out, we almost couldn't make our payroll because of technology concerns. Uh, we were meeting as a leadership team twice a day during that crisis. And then we eased it up to every other day. And, and then you, as circumstance changes, you lighten it up. Uh, so I, I use that as a reference point. I think everybody will decide uh, what they're comfortable with, but it's really what is your leadership and all of your employees going to be comfortable with. It's starting out more frequent so everyone gets more comfortable that they could, you're listening to what they're saying. You're then going to get back to them on the concerns that they raised from the last meeting. And in today's fast paced world of change, you know, doing it once a week may be too long because too many things are changing. So I would say more frequent and use all different levels within your organization. The more you can include, the better. You know, Michael, I, I I would absolutely agree with that, Marty. It's interesting to see within our own organization what's happened. And that is, since we are now all working remotely, we've actually gone from our deal review meetings on Mondays, we've actually started having them multiple times during the week, uh, simply because we no longer have those hallway type meetings. And I, I think Michael's spot on with that, which is it's going to end up being a feel for leaders for how frequently people are going to need a little bit of that uptick or a little bit of that that tuck in or touch and that touch. But mm -hmm. it it's imperative that it's that it happens on a on a regular basis and probably more frequently than they're even used to, at least in the short term. Yep. And you'll you'll know when it's right to change the frequency. Following up on that, Patrick, obviously the messaging is, is always the core of what's important in, in communications during a crisis. But, but I, I, I hearken back to a, to a quote from Tom Landry that, that I've always loved, uh, obviously the famous Dallas football coach. Um, and, and I think his quote was something like this, leadership is a matter of having people look at you and gain confidence. Seeing how you react to a situation. If you're in control of the situation, then they're going to be in control of the situation. Talk about, uh, we've always obviously talked about the number of communications, we've talked about kind of the messaging, but talk about how to hold yourself and, and, and what you need to portray 
in your communications to both your employees and your clients at this time. And by the way, that's an amazing quote coming from a guy who lives right down the street from Giant Stadium. So. <laughs> uh, I swallowed yeah. a little bit in, in giving that one, but uh. <laughs> yeah, I would guess the uh, there is a there's a phrase called to get one's goat, and it actually comes out of the horse racing industry, and it, from from probably centuries past, years and years and years ago. But they used to put goats in with the thoroughbreds because the goats don't react to a whole lot of things that are going around with them. And so when the horses are grazing, then the goats uh, uh, and, and something happens, the horses look over at the goats, the goats don't react, and the horses remain calm. They don't get jittery. So to get one's goat means to usually get someone upset because they would have a practice of stealing the goats from the other owners and upsetting the horses. And that kind of goes exactly um, with what we're talking about in terms of leadership. And that is your teams are looking for leaders. And sometimes those leaders are gonna be titular leaders like the CEO or the COO. And sometimes the leaders are gonna be someone on a team who's a high, who's a high producing, uh, or who's a big producer, or somebody who has influence, but not necessarily authority, okay? And in this case, the goats have influence, but they don't necessarily have authority. So the, one of the things that you wanna make sure of as, as a leader is that your own reaction uh, privately can be whatever you want it to be. But publicly, it also has to be not only realistic, but it, but it has to be somewhat muted because your team members are gonna look at you and, and for your reaction and they're gonna adopt it. So there's certain things you can and cannot say, uh, you know, when you're talking to your team, you know, and lamenting this thing endlessly and how it's damaging the business and falling apart, that is not going to be productive to anyone. Um, however, looking at it and, and admitting, as Michael said it a little bit earlier, yeah, this is tough. This is going to be rough. And I think that we're going to be able to find a pathway to be able to get through this. But in what ways can we start to restructure this business in what ways can we start to compete better in what ways can we get closer to our customers then what you're doing is you're engaging your own team to the to solving of the problems and they realize that yes the problems are there but looking at the way you are responding to it as a leader or as a manager as an influencer they're saying you're soliciting this this input and we are in this together as a unit, as a team. So those are the things that I would say, and I would avoid any of the histrionics that typically you, you hear out there a lot of times on the news media too. Thanks, Patrick. Mike, I wanna talk a little bit about the flip side of, of building confidence, and that is managing the fear of, of your employees. You, we know that the lack of communication with employees is usually filled with with speculation and, and rumors. How did you um, make a practice during these times of crises of keeping your finger on the pulse of what your employees were concerned about, uh, what they were fearful of, when and how did you address those fears? Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the fear that I, I believe goes through everyone right now is just the unknown. As I mentioned earlier, I think all employees are concerned about do they have a job? And I think uh, if everyone knew they had a job, some of their anxiety is going to go away. Sure, they, they may be outside their bonus for 2020, but they're going to be thankful that they have a job. So it's all quite relative. So I, I think the, the fear, the anxiety, it's all about the unknown. And the question is, how do you sort of calm people during a period of unknown? And leadership needs to be cool, calm, and collected. Uh, you don't necessarily have to have all the answers. You know, pardon my language, you can't BS your way through them. You just say, hey, I don't have that answer. Let me get back to you. When they throw difficult questions, you know, you need to be in a position to respond. And what we did um, is when we had uh, the unfortunate uh, decision was made after trying all other options, and we made a cut in the business of personnel uh, everyone then was worried about, well, what, what's happening next? And so it never goes away, the anxiety. It's just a question of how can you, you know, frame it in a way that it is common. So 
it's a it's a tricky item uh but if you're authentic real and they have if they trust what you're saying then you'll be successful in delivering the message yeah as an as an to to go on mike's coattails on that too it, it, candor is one of your best friends mm -hmm. um you know, and, and and because everybody already knows it anyway um, they all know what the what the, your various companies are going through. They're questioning it anyway. So candor demonstrates leadership because it's you're 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 speaking the truth that's kind of out there, obviously, and it also indicates to people that you're not afraid to actually talk about it. Um, mm -hmm. Earlier, you know, the histrionics, avoiding the histrionics is important, but candor is is absolutely critical on this. And the other part is is really understanding. Um, part of eliminating fear is making sure that your team members know that you know about their situation, that you understand about what some of the things that they're facing, because then they feel as if, all right, this person is ultimate as my boss is ultimately going to act in my best interests. Mm -hmm. So, so I, th I think we've gone through kind of the first step and we've covered that in, in, in a crisis and in communication and leadership, and that is building confidence and, and managing fear. But, but I think where a lot of folks um, misstep is kind of making that quick transition. I mean, th that, that's obviously the first step, but then you have to make a quick transition. Um, and and th that step is what I call managing, and then you have to make a transition to what I would call leading. And, and the article I quoted at the outset in Harvard Business Re Review talks about that transition. And the two authors, they were Eric McNulty and Leonard Marcus, who wrote that article, had studied uh, for two decades a um, bunch of private and public sector companies and looked at how they handled crises, when they were successful, when they weren't. And, and the biggest conclusion was that most often the companies that don't make it out or don't make farewell in a crisis are those that are overmanaged and underled. So Patrick, could you maybe pick up on that point from that article? Talk about the difference in your mind between managing and leading and what might be overmanagement versus an underleading. Yeah. Yeah, there's the, and, it, and it's funny because that whole concept goes back to, you know, goes back 30 years back into the 80s where and the, the key phrases back then were transformational leadership and transactional leadership. Transactional leadership being um, effectively crisis management is probably the biggest def definition of it, where you, you have something to be able to get through and you've got to focus in on the objectives at hand versus transformational leadership, which is moving the organization to an entirely different place. So if you think about it, transactional relationships uh, or leadership being managing the football game, but transi uh, uh, transitional leadership being rebuilding the team after a season and, and going forward for the next season. And a lot of times what ends up happening is, is that when we go into a crisis mode, we immediately want to go to that transactional relationship, that transactional leadership type mode, which is get this done, work on this metric, watch this amount of cash, go ahead and get this relationship with the bank done. Here's how we're going to shore everything up. And what a lot of times what we see is that people, because that's their operational comfort zone, they typically tend to stay there instead of being able to look forward two, three, four steps and to be able to say, yeah, this is temporary and it requires management, but I also have got to have an organization to run when this whole thing is over. So while I am managing these items right here, let me also be looking towards the future and how the organization is going to change. And frankly, the long-term impact of COVID-19 on the staffing industry, this is going to happen with this situation right now. The industry is going to change leadership is going to change companies are going to change and if all you're trying to do is manage through this particular crisis then you're going to have you'll you'll have bigger problems when we come out on the other side so transactional and transitional leadership are both going to be required in this particular case 
Michael, maybe you can um, uh, kind of expand on that a little bit. I'd be, I'd be curious as to in a couple different crises that you handled at CoWorks, when did you start looking towards the future and looking to how you needed to transform CoWorks based on either the Great Recession or the hurricane that, that Sandy, as you mentioned, when did you start looking that way? What was that process? Who did you get involved? How much time did you spend on it? Maybe you could answer those questions. Sure. Uh, thanks for the question. I think the right after I had to uh, make the difficult decision to move ahead with a very deep cut uh, during the Great Recession, uh, what got me past all that was thinking about the future. So it was a painful decision to move forward. We, we did it as holistically as we can. We were we tried to be uh, more um, accommodating on the amount of severance we, we gave people at that time. Uh, and we shared that information. But at the same time, we started talking in the organization about what it's going to look like on the other side. As Marty started off with this wonderful bell curve, um, it will turn around and the more we could start taking up the energy of people instead of you know focusing on fear and anxiety to turn into some positive thinking because it will change uh that is very very helpful to start the strategies at the very earliest opportunity uh every industry is different your niche is going to be differently affected your clients are differently affected you may find there are certain aspects of the industry you want to move forward in, certain aspects of product lines you are, are no longer viable based on what's going on today. Uh, all of the leadership and the employees are going to see the same thing. Uh, so I never felt I had to have all the answers. I never felt burdened that way. I, I always felt that if we empower our leadership team and our management team uh, and get their collective thoughts, uh, we will we will find our way through the haze. Marty, if you, if you don't mind, let me jump in on that. For sure, just, Patrick, go ahead. Um, because you know, you referenced in my introduction, you you referenced um, <laughs> the market crash and the recession. You know, back ten years ago in two thousand eight, two thousand nine, right around there, and. Uh, um, What's interesting, we were in the middle of an equity raise in that for a, an electronic medical records company, an electronic health records company. And we ended, up having to we ended up having to close the transaction on the day that the market fell out of bed a couple of hundred points. And you, know, you, you look around and you realize that people are kind of can, can be shell-shocked by that. Um, but, but the fact is, is that even out of those situations, you know, the strong ones are going to rise up. The strong ones are going to survive, and and focusing in on those people around us, um, that was what actually allowed us to create the company and to and to, to be able to go through with that transaction. And our shareholders were happy, as well as our um, as well as our employees and our customers. Everyone came on board. So it's it's never just the end about this. It's going to be absolutely your response to this on how strong your company is going to is going to rebound from something like this there is always going to be opportunities in situations where you, ostensibly you see that there there's only a downtick and if you look historically and you look at the wealth and the fortunes that were created out of the depression and you look after world war ii at the economy that it just exploded afterwards with with consumer demand and everything else and all the fortunes that were made there this will end up being no different but it is going to absolutely rely to the people who are listening to this telephone call and their reaction to it and believing that they're going to come out stronger yep. thanks Patrick. All right. all right i want to just kind of wrap up kind of this section and then we'll we'll move on to another topic i mean i think what i've gotten from, from both two of you is, is a couple of things. Uh, first is, is that it takes a couple different types of leadership to get through a crisis. You can't be just transformational. You can't be just transactional. We haven't talked about being the charismatic leader, but there's a role for the charismatic leader here in, in the messaging. And, and usually one person can't fill all of these roles. So you might, I, I can talk about at our 
organization. I tend to be more transformational and, and, and focused on transformation of, but I'm not very transactional. So you need a little bit of transactional in this as well. So, so we've put together a team knowing kind of the strengths and weaknesses of our leaders and had them kind of playing in the part of the field that they're best at. And, and I think that's really what the message that I get is that you need several different leadership styles and you need to have folks put in a place where they can succeed in those leadership styles. Um, we talked about the, kind of the communications and tasking. I, I want to talk a little bit to kind of what I think is the first financial step in a, in a financial crisis, and that is shifting your attention away from your income statements to your cash flow and your balance sheets. I mean, most of us for the last 10 years have been focused more on our income statements, right? Improving our margins, improving our profit, increasing our EBITDA. Well, a financial crisis. You need to shift the focus away from that. You need to shift it to your cash flow and to your uh, balance sheet. Now, um, I'm, we're not going to talk about it too long, but I do want to touch a little bit on the CARES Act um, because obviously that can be a uh, big financial boost to some folks in terms of their cash flow. Um, so I want to just highlight a couple uh of the important, what I think the most important parts of, of the CARES Act are. Uh, Pecker is going to be having a seminar where we where we go through the CARES Act in, in fine detail with uh, UHY, the accounting firm, in a week. Um, but for right now, I want to hit a couple of the highlights of that. But there's $349 billion set aside in what I think is the most important uh, program for folks, some folks on this uh, webinar, and that is the Small Business Paycheck Protection Program. Now, not everyone qualifies and is eligible for that. Eligibility is for employee employers with under 500 employees. There are some exceptions to that. The SBA has what it calls its industry size standards, and there are some companies in certain industries that can have above 500 employees. Um, and qualify, but for the most part, it's the only folks that are going to be eligible for this are those with fewer than 500 employees. You can borrow up to $10 million. How much you can borrow is based on a formula. The formula is has some complexity to it, but, but boiled down to its simplest state, it's two and a half times your average monthly payroll. And they look back... Um, at your payroll over the past year to determine that. There are certain things included within the formula. Uh, it's salary and other wages. Importantly for the staffing industry, it's commissions. Commissions are included and other types of compensation similar to commissions. Vacation pay, severance pay, uh, group health care benefits are included in calculating your, how much you can borrow, retirement pay, and uh, state and local employment taxes are included in the formula. Now, what is excluded from the formula, and this is important, it's wages above $100,000. So any wages above $100,000 are excluded from the formula. And also excluded from the formula is qualified sick leave wages. So any wages that you can now get a tax credit for under the Families First Act are not included in your uh, calculation of how much you can borrow under this program. There's also restrictions on what you can use the loan for. Um, you can only use the loan to pay payroll costs, healthcare benefits, insurance premiums, rent, and mortgages. That's, those are the primary things that you can use the loan for. If you use the loan properly, it, it can be forgiven. Um, one of the things that folks have to do to make sure that the loan is forgiven is they can't diminish their payroll, they can't uh, let people go, and they can't reduce compensation to folks. Um, now, there is a cure period, so if you do or are forced to lay off some of your employees or reduce the compensation of some employees, there is a cure period, and if you cure within that period, you're still eligible for forgiveness. Um, what's it, if, if you borrow the money and you aren't able to qualify for forgiveness, 
then the term of the loan is up to a maximum of four years at an interest rate of 4%. And there can be a deferment of principal and interest payment for up to 12 months from the time of borrowing. Now, one more important point that I don't think many people are realizing with respect to this program is that I don't believe that you can get loan forgiveness if you are taking the payroll tax deferral option that also exists for companies today. So make sure you check that with your accountant. Now, uh, I don't know, Patrick, if, if you've looked into this, I've looked into this a little bit. I, I think uh, obviously on its face, and this is an 800 page uh, act, so many people are still digging through it and trying to completely understand it. But I think there's some practical aspects to this as well. Um, and that is finding somebody who um, you can actually get one of these SBA loans for. I've made a lot of calls to some of the staffing industry lenders, and um, I don't think these loans are going to be as available, at least immediately, as people initially think. I don't know what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, well, I, we've been doing exactly the same thing, um, you know, because we are not a commercial bank. We are an investment bank, so we sell, you know, buy and sell people's companies for them. So, but but obviously, um, we, we have we still have deals closing even now. So transactions are continuing to go on, and I've been in touch with a lot of bankers um, over the last two weeks or so, just trying to get a feel for it. You know, and everybody from Wells Fargo to Sterling to you know all the uh, you know, SunTrust, uh, whatever the new the new name is, everyone is still scrambling trying to make sure that they can make sense of of this act and how the money gets distributed and and you know what's going to, what is going to be the process and then also scrambling for demand um there's no question that the money is is trying to find its way through the system um you know the real question is is that you know do you go to your current banker do you try to find new bankers um you know in order to help facilitate this and in order to help you guide you through this and through this process because I do believe, I do believe that for the longer term survivability of, of our of these companies, of our staffing companies, is that this provides necessary working capital. And if you could just hold your breath long enough to be able to get some of this money in, then obviously it's going to cure not all the wounds, but it's going to cure some wounds. But I think the 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 bigger conversation has got to be around, you know, what is the relationship that you currently have with your current bank? You know, were you, were you, did you have a good solid relationship with them ahead of time? Do you have that now? Because a lot of times, whenever we get into a crisis mode, Marty, you know, is that it's like friends that call you only when they need something. And you kind of, you know, you rub your head and go, oh, geez, you know, you, you didn't call me two years ago. Now, in some cases, that's going to be, that's going to be what's happening. But frankly, it, it, being able to build those relationships even now for the next downturn is going to be strong and really going to either the banks that you're currently dealing with or finding your friends in the staffing industry who are solid with their bankers that'll help you build relationships with theirs. Um, that's going to ultimately be the way that it goes. But this program is going to be, it's going to be pretty important for in, injecting cash into the staffing industry and being able to help the CEOs and the owners of these companies be able to make it through short term, but you cannot wait. You've got to go. You got to move into action and learn as much as you can about it now. Michael, do you comment on that? I I totally agree with both of you. I think between um, some of the people on this uh, phone call itself and there are other resources out there, the American Staffing Association, as well as the uh, the state chapters. Uh, through their networks and their connections, I think there are going to be other uh, mechanisms for you to learn. I mean, I printed out the 880 pages, I have to say. I did the same thing with the Affordable Care Act. But first of all, you have to, it's, uh, you know, although it looks like English, uh, it doesn't quite read like English. And it's going to take someone uh, who is fluent with it to truly understand uh, what it actually means to each of you. And the sooner you do that, the better off you could be. 
And the thing that I've learned from talking to most of the banks, and, and I think I think in, in staffing, we surveyed, I think, 10 banks and, and in our other industry groups. I spoke to the practice leaders of those industry groups, industry groups who were surveying the banks in trucking and transportation and manufacturing. And the, what, the feedback we keep getting back is that the banks are going to look to service their customers. Um, so the first call that everyone should be making is to their bank because the best chance to get um, relief through this program quickly is going to be through your existing bank. It is going to be, at least right now, it's very early in the process, and I'm sure the, you know, several weeks from now it will change. I think in the immediate future, it's going to be very difficult to get one of these loans through a bank that you do not have a relationship with. So um, I agree with Michael and Patrick. You, you need to be on top of this right away if you qualify. Um, you need to be speaking to your bank immediately about this. Uh, get in line with them. If your bank is not going to be offering uh, this program, then you need to be going out to other industry banks because that's going to be your best bet. Somebody who knows this industry and somebody who um, – won't be afraid to take on a new client because they know the industry well. Um, Marty, okay, talking I, about I gotta totally agree with you on that, and that is someone who knows the industry, banks that know the industry, is critical um, because there there are nuances within staffing that other banks just don't get. And right. and, and and when you have a banker who knows your business and knows the industry, it's very much like Sun Tzu used to say. Then you, you have no fear. Because you, they they can move much more quickly. You know, in the event that you do, you have burned bridges, or you don't have a good relationship with your banker, then obviously by necessity you're going to have to go out to someone else. But I think you are spot on when it comes to go to the people that know you. Well, let's talk about uh, Michael. I'm going to ask you this first question, especially given your background is not over a CEO but a former CFO. Um, let, let's talk about managing cash flow and managing your balance sheet. It seems to me that the first step, and, and this might, is probably a continual process, is forecasting. I mean, I think the first thing you have to do is is run scenarios, run forecasts, and try and get a handle on exactly you know, where your cash position is, where it might be 15 days from now, 30 days from now, 45 days from now. Can you talk about how you've handled forecasting in in the couple crises that you've dealt with? Uh, what type of scenarios you ran? Absolutely. Uh, I think in times of crisis, uh, you have to make things that are typically complex very simple. Uh, it's not the time to re-engineer and pick out a, a playbook that can get into cash flow, discounted cash flow, and all this other good stuff. Uh, we took a very simple, um, if you look at whatever number of clients you have that are a disproportionate percentage of your business, if it's the top 10, top 20, uh, I think you're going to, we can, felt we needed to get a weekly understanding of where we were with our working headcount and the potential open orders uh, to move forward. Uh, and then that gets all into a huge spreadsheet uh, run by our CFO and accounting department. And then you track where you are, estimated versus actual at the end of the week. And then you do the same thing with your existing accounts receivable. Uh, what's your anticipated collections this week versus the actual collections. And then you, you create uh, filters so that you can elongate things without jeopardizing all the formulas. So if, if every account gets A five days, three, seven days, 10 days later than average, what is its impact on cash? Because as we all will realize, liquidity, liquidity and liquidity is going to be the key to be able to get through this. It's going to be your strategic view of how deep cuts you may have to make and what options you will have and extra, you know, um, resources uh, to invest when the timing is right to get out of the depth of this faster than others. So all the forecasting is going to pay off because it's going to give, it's going to help you like navigating a ship. You're going to know where you're going and it's going to impact your liquidity. 
Patrick, maybe you can add to that. And, and I guess the question the, that I'd ask you is, you know, especially when you're starting out, I mean, Michael makes a good point about how that they were learning uh, and, and they were tracking and, and they were using analytics to learn as they went as to what their actual collection rates were and then adjusting their cash. Well, when you first get into this, the first couple of weeks, you don't have much data, right? So um, talk about how you try and uh, create the best data you can um, and how you should you should view and, and look at your first forecast, whether they should be conservative uh, and how they should be run. Yeah, it's it, it, Michael kind of hit it right up front, which is, you know, in any venture that in any startup, I've done a lot of startups, but in any startup, you know, it's that working capital up front that's always going to be key. And if you think about all the staffing companies that are out there right now, vendors included, any, any company that's on this telephone call, um, we are effectively startups in this crisis, meaning we don't have any, if you go back to my original comment about plan versus results, we don't have a plan, nor do we have a result when it comes to managing through this type of crisis. We have other things that we can point to. So working capital is going to absolutely be key on this. And putting together data, it also means that there, there's not a dearth of data out there because there's been other economic downturns that we can point to to start grabbing data and say, what would it look like? We were just working on a deal and we were asked for numbers. Normally on a deal, you'd go back three years for operating numbers, but we were asked for numbers uh, from back in 2007, eight and nine from our client. And we asked the buyer, you know, why they wanted numbers going back that, that far. And that what they were testing was the beta and how the, those numbers moved with response to the economy. So the short answer to your question, Marty, is there are certain extrapolations you can make from past historical events, which are going to certainly give you the data that you, at least an indication or a direction of data that you could use to make some suppositions in order to be able to manage through this crisis. No, you're not gonna find another crisis that's exactly like this, but I think with a little bit of thoughtfulness and a little bit of research, and God knows we have the internet with access to every number that happens to be out there, um, you know, you, you at least have a shot at, at pointing in the right direction. You got 360 different points on a map. You just need to be sure that you're heading in the in the right general direction. And that's what I would say. I would say as a leader, um, and a good friend of mine, Dick Cross wrote this great book called Just Run It. And probably one of the best books ever. He was a, he was a professor up at Harvard and he was a nine time turnaround CEO, very good friend of mine. But he talks in this book about being the 60 minute CEO. And that is take the time to actually think transformationally about the business while you're going transactionally through this crisis to see what numbers, what metrics you're gonna need, not just to get through it, but looking forward. Take that quiet time, isolate yourself, and come up with the strategy. Uh, get both your opinions on this next question. I'll start with you, Patrick. Um, and, and that is, a lot of companies have a credit facility available to them already. And, and they have some room under that credit facility to, to draw down some more capital. And you've seen a number of big companies, GM and a number of companies, announcing that they've drawn down on, on their lines and other available credit. Talk to me about what you believe to be the pros and cons of drawing down into today on a line of credit and available credit. I think, I think the idea of being able to draw down on the line of credit is less scary because you have a known answer. If you're able to secure any of the funds that we were talking about earlier, you at least have a known target date and a known amount. When you're talking about two and a half times payroll and you're talking about, you know, I probably won't be able to get the money for at least two months or so. Those are two variables on the equation that make drawing down on your, on your line of credit a lot less scary. If you didn't have those two elements, you couldn't educate yourself on those at all then I think drawing down on the line ends up being a lot scarier because if the business doesn't actually make it, then you're, you know, you're, most of the people on this call are going to be personally guaranteed to those lines of credit, you know, presumably. So 
you know, in this case, I would actually think that it's probably a better decision to do that now, reserving some of your cash and some of your, you know, and obviously your receivables continuing to come in. We'll talk about vendors in a little bit, I'm sure. But the, uh, I think it's a, it's at least a better bet now drawing down on that than it, than it would be if you did not know those two variables. Yeah, and I could agree more with uh, Patrick. I think the one, there's so many uh, words within those loan documents and who knows that the bank could say, you know what, we're pulling the line from you. So one is what legal, what legally does the documents actually allow for you to do or them to do? So if there's any vagueness, uh, I agree with Patrick, taking it down now uh, gives you far greater uh, strength uh, to weather the storm and the interest expense, to me, uh, I would categorize it, quite frankly, as an insurance policy uh, as opposed to an interest expense. But in addition to drawing down the line, I think it's the opportunity to really get, like we talked about, getting closer to your clients, being forthright with your employees, to really start, if you're not already, to do so with your bankers. Uh, they're going to be concerned about your business, uh, and you, you need to keep them abreast of what's going on, your, your, your response to this crisis, and where they can help you. And, and to the extent uh, you're not in a position now for need to start renegotiating the terms of some of the covenants uh, to prepare yourselves for the rebound. I want to offer some. I want to offer some encouragement too on this because I. I, I what Michael just said is spot on. And that is, uh, we have a client that is mostly the hospitality type staffing space. So obviously their business is getting hammered um, because nobody, you know, you don't have groups of 10 meeting, right? And, and that's what they're really focused. On. And shortly before this whole thing happened is that they started getting rattling from their bank saying, hey, we're gonna be going into a much more of a recession. And we're thinking about, you know, you know, trying to contract some of your line of credit, so on and so forth, right? And as soon as this thing hit, the bank called the client and actually said, no, we're not going to reduce your line of credit. We want you to use that line of credit. Go ahead and do it. And it's because they had a really good relationship with them. And I actually think some of the represent representatives are on this telephone call. And I'll tell you, it totally changed my opinion of of just the willingness of bankers being able to step in provided that you've got a strong argument you got a strong plan and you got a strong relationship with them that they want to be able to the last thing in the world they feel like doing is shutting down a line of credit because what ultimately is going to happen is is that 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 puts the company into a death rattle and and that's not good for anybody including the bank and they heaven knows they don't want your assets they just want their money back so having that that conversation with them and keeping them fully apprised i i really do believe that uh, you're going to do better um michael in terms of speaking of the covenants uh you know there's all kinds of financial covenants in in, in you know asset based and other types of lines lines of credit when you when you were doing your forecasts were you forecasting whether you're going to stay within those covenants were you sharing in advance with with uh your bankers that, you know you know where you may where you may migrate within those covenants. Talk a little bit more specifically on on how you dealt with the covenant issue. I'm sorry, my I, who are you addressing that to? Is that Patrick or Michael? To you, Michael. To you. Oh, uh, yeah. I uh, view of the covenants, and, and specifically, uh, especially if you're going to be taking any of the relief any elements of the relief package from the recent legislation, I suspect that the loan confidence may not address some of those items and you want to make sure you're not going to be adversely affected by doing something through a federal relief program and how it impacts the existing loan confidence. So I think the, you know, there are so many different factors, especially, you know, on the all-encompassing asset-based loans you know, how much, ben how, what, what benefit are they giving you on accrued sales? How much do you have to put away for payroll taxes? You know, or, or every single element of the calculation uh, could be looked at, or it again gets back to what Patrick, uh, Patrick was saying, if you have a very good relationship, it should be an easier conversation. They should be here to help and to broaden so you can 
have the liquidity to get outside of this crisis. The specifics will rely will be within each loan covenant, but I'd say every element of it is up for conversation. Thanks, Michael. Well, let's move to the next step. So, so we you've run your forecasts, um, you've, you've examined your cash flow, and you find there's a gap. You got a material gap between what's going to be coming in the door and your expenses. Um, and maybe that gap is in the future. Um, maybe that gap is 60 days from now. Maybe it's 90 days from now. But, but you see the gap there. I guess the, the question, that, and I'll ask you, Michael, is okay. Wh what wh what do you do? When do you do it? And and obviously we're talking about at this point you're you're going to have. We'll talk a little bit about how, what you can do to manage your revenue stream first. But let's talk on the expense side first. You know, where are the first cuts and when are you going to make them? Yeah, um, I, I think this crisis is different than the Great Recession. Um, there was no indication of that in the Great Recession exactly or a sense of when it's going to change. And obviously it evolved over time. Based on this, um, and we're all hoping that uh, the social distancing and we get through the this month of April, I think everyone's hopeful that the economy sort of eases back starting in May. We don't know what that looks like. We don't even know if it's going to happen that way. But to me, that's the beginning of modeling in that I would be looking at this and say, OK, say I have the, the worst of the worst is between now and the end of April. You know, what does that really model itself within my organization? And then uh, as we all know, in the, in the staffing industry, in a service business, your biggest expense is internal uh, headcount and employees. And uh, knowing that the scenario of when I think the turnaround could be, which is different than the Great Recession, so I think it's uh, one of the few positives, uh, I, I would model on what cut I would need to make uh, and go a little deeper than whatever it says to give me room for errors and omissions. Um, and this way uh, you get you get it past you as soon as possible. And uh, you then are able to say, I think we made to everyone else, we made a very difficult decision. And we, we believe this will get us through the uh, to the other side uh, based on the assumptions that we made at this moment knowing that things can change. Um, but the point is, make the assessment, make it quick, be decisive, uh, and move forward. Thanks, Michael. Patrick, I, I think this is probably one of the most important topics that we're going to talk about today. So, so I want you to expand on, on this a little bit yourself. Um, I know, especially, you know, folks who own small to mid-sized staffing firms, there's a little bit different of a employee-employer relationship, right? And, and they tend to be more hesitant to make internal employee cuts. Um, so with that in mind, can you give some benchmarks or some, some real concrete advice on on when the timing of those cuts what you should be looking for is it a productivity sign uh, or is it just your forecasting right you, you just want to do it in advance you're forecasting a, a shortfall at some point and you want to do it in advance of that shortfall give some concrete advice to, to folks out there about the timing of, of those cuts and 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 what the milestone is that, that should uh, leap them or get them to leap to action on that. Wow, that's a monster question. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, and it's interesting, Marty, what we'll send out to all the attendees on this thing, as I wrote an, uh, uh, actually, I didn't write, an article was written about me in Forbes, um, probably about, I don't know, six, seven years ago, by a guy by the name of Ty Kiesel, and it was called, Whom Do You Fire First? And, um, and 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 I talked about exactly this right here, but I want to I want to frame that up and then and then talk about the particular content of that. A lot of times when we at economies like we've had for the last eight ten years, um, we typically tend to get really comfortable with the organizational structure that produces these prodigious gains in the company. And you know the old term for that is we get fat. 
right? And we we keep people around that it's easier to keep them around because they're not really hurting us and we're really making money on it. And you know, it's 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 easier to keep them around than it is to to be able to streamline it, change the process, change the person, deal with it, or whatever else it is. But it's times like this and crisis like this when you typically tend to get a really, really sharp eye on who is productive and who is not being productive. So the, the first piece of advice per your instruction that I would give is I would actually be looking out, looking at this over the next two months, especially given what you had just uh, released about 20 minutes ago in terms of the requirements of getting some of these forgivable loans, you know, whether or not you're gonna be cutting your staff or not cutting your staff and still eligible for that forgiveness. But that being said, um, is, is looking forward and saying, how does this organization transformationally, how does this organization going to compete, you know, uh, a year from now, two years from now, three years from now? Are there things that we can change now because we're kind of being forced to change that also includes personnel and structure that we also get the benefit of reduced costs? And what would that look like? So I think the absolute mistake is looking down at your leg, seeing that it's got gangrene on it, and then deciding just to cut the thing off instead of actually trying with antibiotics first to cure what you've got. Then when you realize that this is the decision that I have to make, you have 30, 45 days to kind of think through this thing and preserve the, preserve the, uh, the forgivability of your loan as you defined it a little while ago and say, all right, if I'm going to retool, these are the people and that I'm going to be cutting, and this is how I'm going to do it. And there's there's a lot of animus that goes along with, oh my God, I don't want to cut this person. They've been with me for 15, 16 years. But if you've already came come to the decision to be able to cut that individual, it is because you have already figured out that the level of productivity relative to other people is lower. And as a result of that, the the it's that old Star Trek thing. What is it? What you know the 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 health of the many or the the good of the many is important than the the good of the one, whatever that was said. But that's yeah. exactly it. As the leader of the company, your job is to make sure that this company is continuing to feed as many people as as it possibly can, and that might require a couple of roses to get pruned. Now, one last thing I'll I'll add. To if you'll if you'll allow me and that is i am always looking for the people who have buy-in as well as performance that means people who believe what we believe they believe that we can see our way through this they believe in the optimism of the company looking forward they believe that they can take a punch and keep on going and they believe in the mission of the company anybody who does not have the buy-in to the mission or the vision of the company or even in the retooling of the company as it goes forward those are gonna be the first ones on my cut list. Even if they are the most productive people in the organization, I don't want that kind of cancer going on around the company when I'm trying to retool it. And if I could just add to what Patrick was just saying, uh, Marty, I think it's another good time to show leadership and include your leadership team. If you're making a decision uh, behind a closed curtain, uh, I think then you're you're going to expose yourself to where others are saying you're making a decision, but what you didn't let go of this person, and you're letting go of my person, and there wasn't an open dialogue about you know the relative merits, whether it's uh, the positive uh, mindset that uh, Patrick was talking about, their productivity, or is it just a, a sacred person that's been around uh, a very long time? So again, the openness of uh, collaborating with your leadership team on these difficult decisions is going to be very important because it will then trickle down through the organization. Man, Michael, I wish I had said that. <laughs> well, we're working together as a team there. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> well, M Michael, I, I mean, I, I think Patrick and you both have pretty well stated, you know, in making these decisions, you got to look at the greater good of the company, right? Uh, you got to look at at who's fitting in. L let's go through the scenario, and, and and maybe either one of you can answer this. But I'll ask you first, Michael. Okay, you, you've gotten rid of the non-believers. You've gotten rid of the, the historical non-performers. This is your opportunity to, to 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 make those changes that you weren't able to make when when it was better times, and now you're able to make that. That may not always be enough, 
right? So, so um, let, let's talk about that. And Michael, you might have your finger on this more than Patrick, but, but, but maybe Patrick, is there a particular, talking about recruiters, is there a particular point where productivity reaches a certain level, some KPI or something like that, where, okay, you've got to make some other decisions now. And it can't just be the folks who are non-believers and non-historical non-performers. It's got to be other folks that we're looking at. Well, uh, a absolutely. I think it, it, I just want to make sure I, I am inferring the right essence of your question there, Marty. Corporate is not sacrosanct. You know, if, if, if leadership literally goes into operations and let's say you have an on-site, and that on-site is really just virtually collapsed due to the uniqueness of that client, and therefore you're letting go of that staff. I mean, that's really basic 101, okay? But you're going to leave all of your corporate functions untouched when everything else is affected, I think will create a very difficult uh, environment uh, for the leadership team and trickle down through the rest of the organization. So I think in making these difficult assessments, of you know whoever it is that um, needs to, that needs to be um, on the, the the list of people to provide the liquidity that you need. Uh, it includes the corporate functions, each and every one of them. And also, uh, and, and beyond headcount, I think right now there's no one's traveling, so T and E is is at all time lows. Uh, but any discretionary spending, any CapEx that was planned on, anything that's discretionary in CapEx, other than that, I mean, I'm not sure where else there, there is money going out. That you <laughs> right? were, uh, were cold, cold from the pack. And, I, I, yeah. and, and, and you know, the, the, the bigger issue is, is that if, if this is a revelation to anybody now, <laughs> you know, right. um, that's the bigger problem. This should have been an ongoing thing even before this. But yeah, there is a certain amount of productivity that that is going to be a it's going to be a bottom level party, and that is, you know, you're either producing or you're not. You're either helping us pull along. You can't sit in the boat eating our food if you're not rowing towards the shore. Between that saying and now we got the goat one. I mean, I'm writing these down. <laughs> I think I was recording this day. But... <laughs> Um, in terms of other expense items, Michael, that you would look to the cut, um, what, what are some of the other items that you'd look to cut? Or, or along the same lines, what are some conversations you might be having with vendors to, to get an extension of credit um, from vendors? Well, one of the things well, we all know, and if, uh, I think we all know, uh, there's one thing you can absolutely not do. You cannot play around with taxes and withholdings of employees. Uh, despite the temptation of that cash, just don't even think about it for a second. You must make those payments on time. Um, other than the payroll deferral based on one of the, uh, the new pieces of legislation. But um, we had a situation where um, we had a terrible lease. We had a 20-year triple net lease with God with uh, five-year step-ups. And I was in the middle of the Great Recession and I had a step-up due. I uh, brought in the landlord. I brought in a bankruptcy attorney. I gave him my financial statements. We were threatening bankruptcy. And the only thing I got out of it was a deferral of the increase as a lump sum payment at the end of my 20-year lease, which I was 10 years in at the point. Um, but I got something. And um, so I got cash flow relief, but I think the broader point is nothing ventured, nothing gained. Okay, uh, you, you read uh, uh, Cheesecake Factories saying they're not paying the, their April rent. Uh, I don't know if you can do that, <laughs> but uh, I think going to all vendors uh, and re-evaluating your contracts or making requests Again, your clients are going to be doing it, uh, so you might as well do it. The other thing, you know, we were a larger company, and uh, worker comp uh, accrual was a very complex example. But right now, if we were just using that same accrual based on the working uh, people now, based on how you calculate it, uh, you could wind up with an over expense 
well, it's not a cash item, but it's a P&L item. So I would look at some of the accruals you're, you're making in your financial statements. You need for them to be accurate and true up. You don't want to burden yourself in times where it, the accruals based on something that's not relative to what today's dynamic is. So that would be some of the items that I would explore. Okay, let's let's a uh, couple of quick questions and then we'll, we'll wrap it up, gentlemen. Um, we, we talked about kind of managing your cash flow and your balance sheet and, and uh, how to handle that if you're if you're an unhealthy company. Let, let's talk if about if you're if you're managing and, and you're able to do these things and, and you're able to get to a cash positive point. Let's talk about some strategies for, for companies. Um, Patrick, I think this one's up your ballpark. Is this is this a time to buy? Is this a time for you to make acquisitions? If it's not now, is it is it six months from now? What's your what advice are you giving to the staffing firms that are coming to you and saying, is this an opportunity for me to get in the acquisition market? I'll tell you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna hit three balls on one pitch on this one, Marty. Um, and the, 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 the first one, I, I want to tie off something that Michael just said, which is you need to keep your vendors very close to you. Your vendors can be a competitive advantage, provided that you treat them well in the downturn. Um, so make do your best to either pay your bills. Or, or manage the relationship with them because when this ends and we come roaring back, your vendors are going to be your best friends because they are going to be loyal and they are going to turn their attention to the people that help them through this crisis themselves. So very important point. And then that speaks directly to your question, which is, if you are strong, or if you're, you know, if you if you think you're going to be coming strong out of this, and and we definitely have clients who are licking their chops, looking at, you know, uh, at, at some of their competitors kind of going by the wayside, if you're going to come out of this even stronger, um, you know, you have an opportunity to really take the market by storm. And I, my phone has been ringing off the hook this week with buy side searches, um, you know, with people looking to buy companies. So the answer for both buy side and sell side is there will always be a market for staffing companies, right? Both buy side and sell side. The buyers are still buying. We're going to close deals this week, and the sellers are, you know, still want to sell. The problem for the sellers are going to be is that you are going to get some compression on those multiples, and you're already starting to see it. That you know you're down 25, 30 percent in terms of the in in terms of total valuation on it. But that's also just a temporary, you know, it could be just a temporary anomaly based on the fact that everybody knows that revenue is all going down for everybody. So my advice on this one would be to go and attack your markets. This is when you actually get stronger and you start looking around and saying, yeah, are there new, new parts? Uh, if I'm light industrial, are there other industries near me that I could start going into when this thing clears? Is there other, uh, you know, uh, do, I, do I expand out geographically? Do I expand out functionally? Um, you know, this is what you're thinking about now, and heaven knows you've got plenty of time with, with being homebound to think about it. Uh, some of your competitors. I, I truly believe that smart CEOs and smart staffing companies will come out of this stronger than they did even going into it. A couple questions that came in, and let's answer two or three questions, and then, and then Michael and, and Patrick, I'd love for you to give some parting words. Um, one question that came in, Michael, and I'll direct, you, direct this to you, is what about offering discounts to your clients to, to pay their bills in a timely fashion? And I've certainly seen clients are offering 10% discounts if you, if you pay timely. What's your, what's your thought on, on discounts for, for, for prompt or early payment in this type of a crisis? All right. Uh, my discounts to me are the same as rebates. I, um, it comes off the top number. It comes off, it's a percentage of sales. And we live in, in markup percentages and, um, and bill rates uh, is off of the payroll number. So any percentage you would agree to is actually has a bigger percentage on your, your markup or your bill rate. And you got to be very mindful. I never, ever agreed to a, a discount. The cost, when you actually analyze it, uh, is, is far greater 
than the actual cost of the time value of money. Now, the other thing you need to be mindful of is not uh, just the discounted uh, cost. Uh, you may not have the luxury of extending the time because they say, okay, our terms are 30, that's what we agreed to. Now we need to be at 60 or 90, but it may then impact your liquidity and your ability to borrow uh, because of your loan confidence. You know, all of a sudden your aging goes out. So it, it's, you need to be mindful of all the dynamics of, of, of that conversation and how it attack, impacts your financials and your loan agreements because it could affect your overall liquidity. But the math never works. You know. We've had a number of questions on kind of the, <laughs> it is an interesting dichotomy. You've got the CARES Act that, that requires you to keep your employees on, but, but you call, you've got the financial uh, crisis that, that may require you to make cuts, and, and we've got a number of questions from folks about the CARES Act. And I can't, we're not going to be able to answer all of them, but but you know, one thing to remember about the CARES Act is, two, you can get partial forgiveness. Okay, so even if you do have some changes in your payroll, that doesn't mean you go from uh, complete forgiveness to, to zero forgiveness. There is partial forgiveness, and there is. Um, a formula in the CARES Act for partial forgiveness. There also, as I indicated, it, there is a cure period. So you do have a chance to hire folks back and to reinstate salaries during the cure period and to keep um, your right to forgiveness. Um, even beyond that, remember about the CARES Act loan, a couple of things that are, that are quite unique. One, it's a 4% loan for up to 10 years. You may have some deferral on principal and interest for six months or the first year. So in terms of a lifeline, if you're, if you're in a really difficult position, even if you don't get forgiveness of the loan, you've got a darn good loan for a long period of time where you have some interest deferral and you have, uh, you have principal deferral on top of it. Um, if you spend the loan in the correct way, meaning, if you dedicate the loan to those items that I spoke to before, it's a non-recourse loan, okay? There's no guarantees. Um, so yes, obviously everyone out there should wanna try and take this loan and should try and achieve um, some cash flow and financial stability and look to get forgiveness. But even without the forgiveness, this loan on its face is, is a pretty good loan. So, so folks should keep that in mind. I don't know, Patrick, if you feel differently about that. No, I, I, I think it's, I think it's, I, I do. I think both answers sufficed for, for, for anything else that I would add. <laughs> All right, Patrick, parting words. I, I think through strife comes strength. Um, I really do. And I think that, while this looks like a debacle from a whole lot of different ways, I think strong companies are going to come out strong and led by strong people are going to come out even stronger. And I think that 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 probably some of the companies that are going to fall away, we're going to fall away anyway. This just accelerates the process. I do believe that there is a learning curve that we all have out there to be able to at least focus in on what is going to make a material difference and to, to harken back to what you said initially starting out, not just be the transactional leader, be the transformational leader that this is going to require. And as Winston Churchill said, never, ever, ever give up. Never, ever, ever give up, <laughs> right? No matter what happens, you keep on going. You get knocked down seven times, you stand up eight times. Michael? Well, uh, I, I agree with uh, Patrick's sentiment. Um, I think that many of the attendees on this call, and I uh, want to thank Marty for organizing and my uh, co-person, uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, we lived through Hurricane Sandy. We lived through the Great Depression, uh, and we're here today talking about this. Uh, we're going to learn and get to the other side of this. and. Uh, we're here to further have conversations with you, but lead from your heart and include everyone else on your leadership team and make this an opportunity 
uh, for your company and being forthright and it will pay off in huge dividends. Thank you. Well, Patrick and Michael, I really want to thank you for, for giving your time. Uh, this is a critical moment for the industry and, and to have two folks who are so well respected in the industry give an hour and a half of their time to this topic is really uh, thankful that you did that. Um, to the audience, uh, appreciate your log logging in and listening. Uh, all three of us are available. Um, you should be able to feel free to reach out to Patrick, reach out to Michael, reach out to me. Um, we will be reaching out. We weren't able to answer every question. We will be reaching out uh, with answers to questions that we were unable to uh, answer during the broadcast. And as I indicated at the beginning, this was recorded, and we will be sending a link with the recording. Uh, good luck to everyone. Stay safe, and thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.